everybody and welcome to another episode of Creepy Knitting. Uh, my name is Bernadette and this is the little corner of the internet where I knit and I talk about true crime. Uh, this week we're continuing on in our series of women in true crime but before I hop into who we're talking about I will quickly talk about what I'm knitting. I am still working away on my advent blanket um, that I was working on last time. Uh, I did work on it a little bit <laughs> not uh, on creepy knitting. So we're into this multicolored stripe here that's a mini from Gem State Yarns. Uh, if you want any more information about the project or if you want to find me anywhere else on social media or the internet, all of those links are down in the description. This week we're talking about one of my favorite true crime ladies, <laughs> I guess. Uh, we're talking about Eileen Warnos today. Her story is tragic, but I really... I like her story. Like if you follow it, it makes the most sense um, as to how she ended up where she was. All right, so in record time, we'll <laughs> hop right into it here. Eileen uh, Warnos was born Eileen Carol Pickman in Rochester, Michigan. I always want to say Rochester, New York. <laughs> Rochester, Michigan. Um, on February 29th, uh, 1956. At the time, her mom was 14 years old um, and she married Eileen's father, who was 16 years old, only two years before Eileen was born. Obviously, because they were children, after less than two years of marriage and two months before Eileen was born, her mother filed for divorce. Apparently, Eileen had never met her father. In uh, January of 1960, um, when Eileen was about four years old, her mother abandoned them uh, at their maternal grandparents' house. By the age of 11, uh, Warnos was engaging in sexual activities um, at school in exchange for cigarettes, drugs, and food. She apparently also engaged in sex acts with her brother, and she also said that her alcoholic grandfather sexually assaulted and beat her when she was a child. And before beating her, he would force her to strip out of her clothes. In 1970, at the age of 14, she became pregnant after having been raped by an accomplice of her grandfather. Warnos gave birth uh, to a boy at a home for unwed mothers on March 23rd, 1971, and the child was placed for adoption. A few months after her son was born, she dropped out of school, which was around the same time that her grandmother died of liver failure. Um, so at the age of 15, her grandfather threw her out of the house, um, and she began to support herself as a sex worker, um, and she was living in the woods near her old home. Like I said, looking at her early life, you can really understand why she ended up uh, the way she was. Mental illness also like ran in her family. So we have the fun combination of, as an understatement, an unstable childhood and also mental illness. I believe when she got, um, when she's in prison, she's diagnosed with schizophrenia. On May 27th, 1974, at about 18, uh, Eileen was arrested in Jefferson County, Colorado for driving under the influence, uh, disorderly conduct, and firing a 22 caliber pistol from a moving vehicle. She was then also charged with failure to appear. And in 1976, Warnos hitchhiked to Florida where she met 69-year-old yacht club president, Louis Gratz Fell. They quickly married and the announcement of their nuptials was printed in the local newspaper, which I don't, do they still do that? <laughs> do they still like announce marriages and newspapers? I guess they must because they still do obituaries, but uh, Warnos continuously involved herself in like confrontations at local bars and she apparently briefly went to jail for assault because of that. She also apparently hit her new husband at some point with his cane, um, which caused him to file a restraining order against her within weeks of their marriage. She returned to Michigan where on July 14th, 1974, she was arrested in Antrim County and charged with assault. Uh, and disturbing the peace for throwing a cue ball at a bartender's head. I'm laughing uh, because it feels like Eileen would be one of those friends who you're just like, you have no idea what's going on with them. They're just agents of chaos just living their lives. <laughs> you're like, how? What? Obviously, it's a side effect of her upbringing and her mental illness, but I'm just imagining having Eileen as a friend and just being like, are you okay? What's going on? <laughs> She clearly didn't have those friends though, or this wouldn't be happening. So uh, on July 17th, uh, 1976, Warnos's brother Keith uh, died of uh, esophageal cancer and Warnos received a $10,000 payout from his insurance. Only a few days later, Warnos and Fell annulled their marriage on July 21st after only nine weeks of marriage, August 1976. Warnos was giving, given a $105 fine for drunk driving. So she 
used obviously the money that she'd inherited from her brother to pay the fine and um, she spent the rest of the ten thousand dollars within two months um, buying luxuries like a new car and things she didn't need. Um, she apparently also shortly wrecked the car after buying it. Getting large payouts like that to people who've never had a lot of money is I think one of the most dangerous things that can happen. <laughs> if you've grown up without money what ends up happening a lot is that you well, besides not knowing how to handle it um, or being taught what to do with it, money is kind of like something you expect to expire and disappear. So I'm not really surprised that Eileen didn't like set up a savings account, <laughs> like use it as a way to like better her life. I'm like not shocked in any capacity. So skipping ahead, um, May 20th, 1981, Eileen was arrested in Edgewater, Florida for the armed robbery of a convenience store where she stole $35 and two packs of cigarettes. She was sentenced to prison on May 4th, 1982 and released on June 30th, 1983. We're going through all these petty crimes before we get to like the real juicy murder because it really sets up her story. So less than a year later on May 1st, 1984, Warnos was arrested for attempting to pass forged chest checks at a bank in Key West. And on November 30th, 1985, uh, she was named as a suspect in a theft of a revolver and ammunition in Pasco County. January 4th, 1986, Warnos was arrested in Miami and charged with car theft, resisting arrest, and obstruction of justice um, for providing identification bearing her aunt's name. So just a little casual identity theft. Miami officers found a 38 caliber revolver and a box of ammunition um, in her stolen car. This is the last bit of uh, contextual crime information. Um, June 2nd, 1986, uh, Volusia County deputy sheriffs detained Warnos uh, for questioning after a male companion accused her of pulling a gun in his car and demanding $200. Um, Warnos was found to be carrying spare ammunition and police discovered a 22 caliber pistol under the passenger seat uh, that she had occupied. That kind of sets up her MO for what um, she would later do, do in her actual like future killings. Around this time, Warnos met Tyra Moore, a hotel maid at a Daytona Beach lesbian bar. They quickly moved in together and Warnos supported them with her earnings as a sex worker. July 4th, 1987, uh, Daytona Beach police detained Warnos and Moore at a bar for questioning regarding an incident in which they were accused of assault and battery with a beer bottle. So Moore coming into Warnos's life didn't add any extra stability. Um, there are a lot of accusations floating around the internet that uh, Moore just took advantage of Eileen's kind of like chaotic brain and the way she had to live her life. People's lives, you have people that are like stabilizing anchors and Moore was not one of those people for Eileen. On March 12th, Eileen accused a Daytona Beach bus driver of assault. She claimed that he pushed her off the bus following a confrontation. Moore was listed as a witness to the incident. So this bus incident is the last thing we have on record before Eileen starts her like killing spree. Eileen ended up killing seven men within 12 months. One of the reasons Eileen stands out as a killer is because most female killers don't kill um, in the way that she did. Most male serial killers tend to have some weird like sexual aspect to their murdering and they tend to use guns a lot more often than women do. So Eileen combined both of these things, the sexually motivated killing um, along with um, using a gun. Not saying that women don't use guns, but women tend to use subtler ways of killing like a lot of poisoning. Although the women we've talked about for the past two weeks like negate this trend, but that's probably why I chose to talk about them because I find poisoning very boring. Anyhow, using a gun and having a sexually based motive is the reason uh, Eileen stands out amongst female serial killers. She murdered seven men within 12 months. Uh, the first one was Richard Charles Mallory, age 51, murdered November 30th, 1989. He was a convicted rapist who um, Eileen claimed to have um, killed in self-defense. She claimed that she was sodomized, brutally beaten after being driven to an abandoned area for a sexual request. Um, just a reminder throughout this time, she's working as a sex worker. Most of the time she would pick these guys up or these guys would pick her up and then she would claim that she was raped. 
these guys would pick her up and then at some point during their ride uh, she'd shoot them so two days later a Volusa County Deputy Sheriff found Mallory's abandoned vehicle and on December 13th his body was found several miles away in a wooded area he'd been shot several times uh, two bullets to his left lung were found to be the cause of death next up was David Andrew Spears who is age 47 he was a construction worker in Winter Garden he was declared missing May 19th 1990 um, on June 1st, 1990, his naked body was found along uh, Route 19 in Florida in Citrus County. Um, he'd been shot six times by a 22 caliber pistol. Next up is Charles Edmund Karskadon, who was age 40. He was killed May 31st, 1990. Um, he was a part-time rodeo worker. And on June 6th, 1990, his body was found in Pasco County. He'd been shot nine times with a 20 caliber weapon um, and his body had been wrapped in an electric blanket um, and it was apparently very badly decomposing. Witnesses saw Warnos in possession of Charles's car and Warnos had also pawned a gun identified as belonging to Charles. Next was Peter Abraham Symes. Um, age 65. He was a retired merchant seaman. In June 1990, Symes left Jupiter, Florida for Arkansas, um, which I always want to say Arkansas. <laughs> Arkansas. On July 4th, 1990, his car was found in Orange Springs, Florida. Moore and Eileen were seen abandoning the car and uh, Eileen's palm print was found on the interior door handle. Um, his body has apparently never been found though. Next was Troy Eugene Burris, who is age 50. He was a sausage salesman from Ocala. Uh, sorry for laughing at the fact he was a <laughs> sausage salesman. I'm imagining going, him going to door to door with a suitcase of sausages. Just definitely not what his job was, but that's why I'm laughing. On July 31st, 1990, he was reported missing. And on August 4th, 1990, his body was found um, in a wooded area along, again, State Road 19 in Marion County. Um, he had been shot twice. Next was Charles Richard Humphreys, age 56. He was killed September 11th, 1990. He was a retired US Air Force major and a former state child abuse investigator and a former chief of police. On September 12th, 1990, his body was found in Marion County. He was fully clothed and had been shot six times in the head and torso. His car was found in Sewanee County. I'm saying these places like I have any idea <laughs> where they are in Florida. No idea. Absolutely zero clue. And uh, last on Eileen's hit list was uh, Walter Geno Antonio, uh, age 62. He was a trucker, a security guard, and police reservist. On November 19th, 1990, uh, Antonio's nearly naked body was found near a remote logging road in Dixie County. He had been shot four times, and five days later, his car was found in an entirely different county. So on January 9th, 1991, Eileen was arrested for an outstanding warrant um, at the last resort, which was a biker bar in Volusia County. Um, police located her girlfriend, uh, Moore, uh, the next day in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which uh, immediately plays the office theme song in my head. Moore immediately agreed to elicit a confession from Warnos in exchange for immunity from the prosecution. No matter how destructive the relationship seems from the outside, Eileen felt like Moore was the only person who ever really loved her. Um, so the fact that this person flipped on her and clearly didn't actually care about her as a person is tragic. Eileen was found guilty of the murders um, thanks to testimony testimony provided by Tyra and also uh, based on the confession that Tyra got from Eileen. She was sentenced to death and incarcerated at the Florida Department State of Corrections uh, Broward Correctional Institution. She was then transferred to Florida State Prison for execution. In 2001, a petition to the Florida Supreme Court stated her intention to dismiss um, her legal counsel and terminate all pending appeals. Uh, she wrote in the petition that, um, quote, uh, to quote her, I killed those men, I robbed them as cold as ice, and I do it again too. There's no chance of keeping me alive or anything because I'll, <laughs> because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system. I'm so sick of hearing this she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times. I'm competent, sane, and trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human stuff and would kill again. Her attorneys argued that she wasn't mentally competent um, to make such a request 
Ornos insisted that she knew what she was doing and a court appointed panel of psychiatrists agreed. In 2002, Ornos began accusing prison of tainting her food with dirt, saliva, and other things. Uh, she over she said that she overheard conversations among prison personnel that they were trying to get her to the brink so that she would commit suicide. She complained of a lot of other things happening at the prison that showed distaste and uh, pure hatred towards her. In the weeks before her execution, Warnos gave a series of interviews to Broomfield, talked about being taken away to meet God and Jesus and the angels and whatever is in the beyond. In her final interview, she once again charged that her mind was tortured at the prison um, and her head crushed by sonic pressure, which is a uh, code for she was losing her mind. Um, she'd lost all grip on reality and was hallucinating a lot of things happening in the prison. She thought she was being poisoned and mistreated. It is possible that she was being mistreated in some way, shape or form. Just think a lot of it was probably in her head. Ornus's execution took place on October 9th, 2002. She declined her last meal, which could have been anything apparently under $20, which rude. She opted for a cup of coffee. Her last words were, yes, I would just like to say, I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus. June 6th, just like the movie, big mothership and all, I'll be back. She died at 9.47 a.m. Eastern Daylight time. She was the 10th woman in the United States and the second in Florida to be executed since uh, the death penalty was reinstated in Florida in 1976. Ornos' body was cremated and her ashes were spread beneath a tree in her native Michigan by her childhood friend Don Botkins. Eileen's story has like a lot to it. Um, there have been several like movies made about her. Weirdly enough I haven't actually seen Monster um, but I've heard it's quite good. Apparently it's on Amazon and it's on my watch list so I should probably get around to that. That is the story of Eileen Warnos. I've always wondered what her life would have been like if she'd grown up in a better household or like heck even if she'd been put into foster care. I know foster care isn't like a great time for most people but it feels like it would be better than being pregnant and living in the woods. I could be wrong. I realize it's a crapshoot. It's a complicated system. One of the reasons I like Eileen besides the obvious nature of her story and the fact that like we can clearly see logically how everything played out is the fact that um, she kind of flipped the sex worker narrative because most of the time it's the John who is the serial killer and the sex worker who gets killed. I just kind of like this is one story <laughs> where the sex worker gets the upper hand. Thank you for sitting and knitting with me um, and I hope that you're happy, healthy, and that your crafting is bringing you joy. Bye guys! Mm -hmm.